On behalf of Bioeconomy Corporation, I would like to thank everybody for joining us here today. This is our third session in the series. And before we take communication to give the welcoming remarks, Ms. Jess. I'm Mr. Kelvin, Managing Director of Early Bio Extracts, um, distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Bioeconomy Corporation, Morning. This is the third of our webinar series under My Bio Reach, which is national reach program that aims to engage and empower the rakyat through awareness and developments in bioeconomy. Uh, the webinars are meant as a knowledge sharing session on various topics from ministries, agencies, entrepreneurs, and individuals with expertise in their related fields. We are excited to bring you yet another interesting webinar topic today, namely building your own product. We are pleased to have Mr. Kelvin to share his knowledge and experience as he is well versed in this subject matter. We are also proud to have our Mr. Su present uh, to represent the Bionexus status companies today. What's qualified by which confers them certain guarantee exemption? We are proud to see growing success of our Bionics status companies such as Furley over the years. Okay, and um, we are even prouder to see them sharing their experience for, the, for others. To be success sharing spirit, we hope our webinar will make you reach closer to your goals and that you will spread that knowledge for others to benefit. Okay, this is the kind of supportive and selfless community that we want to see. pandemic. So finally, a huge thanks to everyone again for joining us today. May you gain valuable benefits from today's session that will bring you much success and endless opportunities. Thank you and over to you, No. Thank you. Thank you. Since you build your own brand today, we have Mr. Kelvin Su, Managing Director, as just mentioned, from Pearly Bio Extracts. Mr. Kelvin will talk about the steps you need to start you need to take, sorry, to start an OEM business, making and selling your own brand products, as well as the before I call Mr. Kelvin to begin his presentation, I would like to remind you that there will be a Q&A session at the end of his talk. If you do have a question before, to begin his talk. Mr. Kevin, please. Thanks for that, Noor. Uh, good morning, guys. How are you guys this morning? Um, well, they've asked me to speak for about one and a half hours about OEM. So I uh, hope you guys are ready because I've prepared quite a lot of content. Uh, we'll be covering from um, selecting the factory, uh, understanding the certifications, uh, you know, Misty, Hesed, Halal, and all that. Do you really need which one and what do you need? Uh, and all the way until marketing and SEO optimization, looking for trends, understanding what are the products that you want to put into your products and looking, um, using, you know, big data to really figure out, to see whether, um, you know, for example, you want to add vitamin C to that collagen product that you want to make. So I'm going to start now. Let me load up my presentation here. Uh, okay. Say share screen. Okay, so this is my company. I inherited this late company from my beloved father. And uh, we are a Bionexus status company since I think 2006. Uh, we've really moved on from what we were in the beginning. Uh, but there's one thing that we have always prided ourselves on is actually um, that mango steam. And uh, we've really taken it quite far, I believe, uh, until making it into a wound care product. So this is our lo lovely little home uh, out in Simenit, really far away from everyone. 
But um, before COVID, you could come and visit. Now you can't come and visit. So that's uh, that's the difference. Uh, so this is me. I've uh, got a PhD in, food, uh, in chemical engineering, master's in applied chemistry. I mentor for Taylor's University, Shaman University, Magic and Cradle. I've worked for the government of Malaysia and I enjoy publishing papers um, academically in terms of uh, the Manguist You can find me on Google and stuff. And uh, there's actually a sufficient amount of content online as well, uh, published by our company, uh, on what to look out for and what to do for OEM products. Uh, I would say, you know, one of the big things for Furley is, uh, you know, to always be first to innovation and to really look out for those unique uh, selling points and to put the effort and time to invest to making those products. I think just now I was just going through um, some new products uh, being proposed to us and there are household products in powder format, which is quite cool. I think it's going into it's the eco-friendly um, area of um, products, you know, reducing waste and packaging, stuff like that. I think that's already coming around uh, in the next not too distant future. So it means that we might need to invest in those machineries and certifications. So let's skip all this stuff. So we have a variety of lines, which is why I am uh, multi-versed in a variety of different OEM products. We have supplement licenses, traditional license, food license, cosmetic license. Uh, and now we have ISO 13485, which means that we can manufacture medical devices class A. Uh, those are things like a wound irrigation solution, stuff like that. Probably not too relevant today. We we'll just focus on the cosmetics and the edibles. And these are some of the certifications you'll be looking out for. Um, yeah, these just are papers that you should have when you're working with the OEM factory. Yeah, you can go through them later. They're not that important. They're just a bit of your duty. So let's start with uh, your OEM journey, which is why we're all here, right? Um, if you can write in the message what type of products you're making or what kind of products you intend to make. Is it a cosmetic? Is it a food, powder, or drink? Uh, let me know so then I can kind of figure out um, what type of crowd we have today. And then I'll try to cater uh, the content a bit better for the majority of the crowd. So are you ready? There are so many things to cover. Um, I think one of the big things that uh, a lot of people miss out on uh, when they start their business is um, you know, trying to get that story right. What's your mission and your story? And does your product really fix a problem? Or are you just doing a um, price undercut type of thing? I think one big thing that we see amongst um, companies that we, we, you know, we ourselves as factories support more are companies which actually have very clear distinguishing factors and they have a very clear methodology of um, advancing uh, their game plan. You know, having a good budget, understanding that strategy behind it is probably one of the biggest things that uh, we look out for for companies. Uh, so you say, you know, we are just a factory. Actually, we are a bit more than that. Uh, sometimes we, 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 you know, we will invest our time, we will reduce the quantities and we will improve the pricing just to take a slight bet on the companies that are working with us uh, because we feel this company really has an advantage over everyone else. Um, maybe they just don't have enough capital to meet the quantities and maybe the first round we might not make all that money that uh, we need to make and uh, we'll just take a little, but a little gamble there. And I think one big one uh, that we've seen are companies that actually um, have a partner, you know, a journey partner or you could call them a mentor, I wouldn't really call them that, um, probably a check-in or a group of uh, like-minded people who are able to share their experiences uh, amongst each other and are around about the same level of growth in their business. And I think from there, it's easier to figure out um, and you know, overcome a lot of the similar hurdles. It could even just be um, certain documentations for importation or even documentations for export and what to look out for for an export. I think um, a, lot of, a lot of problems in Malaysia uh, is, the information given is too wide and too many. I think the information it needs to be a bit more streamlined. And usually the information which actually makes the most sense is that given by people who have actually gone through the process. Right? And to be able to reach out to a group of friends or a group of people that have that same uh, experience and are willing to share is far and few. So, um, you know, try to, try to link up with each other and, and try to build that little community that, that will help each other, right? So I think one of the big things they asked us to, to cover today is, you know, why do you want to run your own brand? Why don't I just, you know, take other people's stuff and sell it? Well, um, definitely you can. And I think it's a, 
it's a it's a um, it's a structure that has been ingrained in Malaysia for a really long time. The agent model or the MLM model, direct sales, um, distributors. Um, nothing wrong with that. Um, but you know, there's a few things that you realize, and I think you might have experienced it yourself. You know, uh, sometimes you don't have enough stock. You come up um, every month. You need to order stock. The marketing sucks. The marketing collateral is not current. You know, it's not trending. It's not fast enough. They're shitty, not good enough uh, distribution points. Well, when you do your own product, everything is your own fault, um, which is a good and a bad thing, right? Um, if you can overcome them, of course you will you will see success. But if not, then maybe better to stick to your own uh, to other people's products and sell that because um, doing your own product is pretty much uh, growing your own baby in your own business, which is uh, in itself uh, a gargantuan task. So um, it's not for everyone, um, but there are a lot of things that you need to uh, look out for and think about. And we'll probably cover it today. Um, I do hope you have <laughs> some of content. I just hope you guys can, um, you know, bear with me. If you have any questions, just put them in the thing and more will pass them on to me. So first things we're going to talk about is the certification of factories and why do you need them? Um, when you make a product, uh, most foods or cosmetics will fall into some of these categories. Um, a lot of people, funnily, uh, they go for the MISTI. Uh, actually, MISTI is the lowest level entry um, certification for factories. And it's actually usually reserved for micro entrepreneurs. Um, if they have HACCP or GMP or ISO uh, 22000, which will be writing on top of that GMP, you don't really need the MISTI. The MISTI is usually a shortcut to get halal if the other licenses they can't comply. Uh, because of certain standards that um, they cannot meet. GMP has some certain requirements, which um, sometimes you just don't want to invest the money. So you just go for MISTI. So MISTI is actually the lowest level of, uh, of certification. Um, not recognized internationally, um, but it's more for the micro entrepreneurs. Maybe you want to pack things at your own house or you want to do your own business at home. MISTI is probably the way for you and not GMP because GMP is pretty vigorous. And then as you start to go up, it gets more expensive. How long would our doubt definitely want to take? Uh, problem being is the cost to register the products for certain individuals, a bit expensive. Um, FDA is more of a notification type of thing, similar to cosmetics for those that are, uh, similar, are familiar in that area in Malaysia, the NOT. FDA kind of operates in a similar type of fashion, except they encompass um, foods and cosmetics and supplements all at one go. So um, with that, you, it's a hit and miss, you don't really need it. People usually use it for marketing. What you don't really know is, um, you know the ISO certifications and some HACCP certifications uh, from certain, uh, what they call CVs or certifying bodies. They actually don't allow you to use their logos. So all the logos you see on products are actually just um, recreations. Uh, we actually sign agreements with these certification bodies, which uh, clearly states, we are not to display their logos on products. Uh, they are not used for marketing. Uh, so the other logos that you want to put are up to you that write these ISO 22000 and has it. Um, so you can only use and tell people about the certifications and logos if it's in the context of manufacturing. So why do you go through all this hassle to get this GMP HACCP factory to work for you? And by all means, yes, they will cost you a little bit more because of uh, that certification process uh, that the factory needs to maintain and that audit trail. And the reason being is number one, locally, domestically for uh, cosmetics, anything you apply externally uh, and supplements, they are mandatorily required to be registered, which means that um, they need to come from a GMP certified factory. Supplements in Malaysia are a bit unique. Um, they fall under the MAR registered products, as you can see here. Uh, good and bad, good is in Malaysia, highly regulated, means there's a lot of things you cannot say on the packaging. You need a lot of approvals and payments for these approvals to, to do that, um, as opposed to a food product, um, which is a bit more liberal, but still has an advertising act um, governing it. So you cannot advertise or say things that, um, you know, cures this and that or helps with this and that for uh, diseases is not recommended and probably you get a letter. Um, for export wise, uh, why you need the GMP is when you have GMPs, uh, you can get this thing called the Certificate of Free Sales. Uh, so when you want to sell to a foreign market, 
uh, certificate of free sales is used as a registration document. And it pretty much tells the other government that, uh, you know, it's sold in Malaysia and Malaysian government recognizes it as a safe and approved product to be sold here. It just helps with that uh, registration step. Uh, the equivalent of that is called the CPP or the Certificate of Pharmaceutical Product. And that's for MAR registered products. So I'm talking about supplements, traditional uh, products. Um, it is a very difficult uh, registration process because that one actually starts to fall under uh, drugs and OTC type of regulation. And depending on the country, it can get super complicated. So uh, this is the downside of having an MAR registered product in Malaysia and selling it to a foreign market to export because that CPP uh, registration, it just makes the registration much more complicated than what it should be in another country. So these are some things you just need to think about uh, when you approach the factory. I think generally you need to look for the GMP. Uh, so then, you know, you future proof yourself. You're gonna spend all that time trying to build the product and getting it sold throughout Malaysia. And then maybe you got a distributor, you wanna export the product. So definitely just go for the GMP. You can skip the rest and uh, minimum GMP, everything else onwards, right? So, uh, this is an interesting one. <laughs> Recently, I have been getting a lot of agreements. Uh, a lot, I mean two this year. Um, I think this is absolutely silly. Uh, and I think it was interesting to see that lawyers have been pushing uh, the little rice ball a bit bigger. And they're trying to get um, new entrepreneurs to submit agreements to factories. And I think uh, the only reason, I put this in here last minute because it was something that popped up into my mind. Um, as you know, in agreements, there's always um, something that you want to protect. You know, is it an IP? Is it something that you want to protect? Price, whatever it is. Uh, but there's another thing that the lawyer forgot to tell you. In most agreements, um, we're talking about supply agreements, um, you would need to provide a forecast and a committed forecast of actual fact for the factory to be interested to uh, sign this agreement with you. Um, in this sense, um, I highly don't recommend it. Um, especially when you're starting out, it just, it's a real put off for a lot of factories. And if your order, I mean, you put it in your own shoes, you sit there and then you look at the factory um, of a X size. I think if the project's less than I don't know, 100,000 ringgit in profit, I wouldn't even bother to look at the contract. 20,000 is really uh, not a lot for a factory. Um, it's pretty much a starting out sum, even 10,000 is just a starting out sum for factories. So more than likely the risk to sign this contract um, outweighs the, the profit of that business. And it might be more wise for the factory to skip on this project. And you know, you would ask, you, you ask yourself, I wanna protect myself, how, how do I do that? Well, it's actually you still can. Um, you, I'm pretty sure factories are okay signing non-disclosure agreements. Um, that's quite common for us, uh, for a variety of um, businesses that we handle from small to large. And it's not unreasonable. I think it's unreasonable to ask the factory to sign a supply agreement, um, especially if you don't have uh, a commitment with the factory in the sense of how many orders you can give them a year. And I think to negotiate a successful a contract is, um, you know, it's a, it's a two, two prong party process. Uh, everyone needs to gain something from it. There is no loser. The loser being is um, when one of, the, one of the individuals is more desperate to get this contract signed. So it's kind of playing chicken amongst each other sometimes, but usually uh, when we sign contracts, it's a win-win for both. And um, then the, can the factory will take a lot more responsibility on deliverables of the product in terms of timeline, costing, uh, and the customer will endeavor to pay the factory um, sometimes before or after uh, completion of manufacturing of the project. Uh, so don't get drawn in by all these lawyers telling you all these stories about contracts. It's an absolute waste of money. Uh, I think it costs you around two to 5,000, sometimes 10,000 to draft a supply agreement. Not with it, uh, you can do it peer to peer basis and talk to um, the company that you're working with and tell them, I wanna add certain terms in the POs and have that fixed into the PO. And I think that is a much easier way to handle it uh, in terms of what you wanna protect. Bear in mind, uh, there's one contract I, I recently had a look at. It was quite interesting. They had an IP or they thought they had an IP. That is their formulation. You know, you mix A plus B plus C and then you get something. Um, interestingly enough, they came to us because they want to register for MAL traditional, uh, which is a very um, interesting one. Because MAL traditional products or any MAL registered product in Malaysia requires full, full declaration on the label, which means that um, 
pretty much the whole of, everyone will know your formulation. The breakdown, the percentages will be displayed on the packaging, which essentially means that um, your formulation will be open to public domain. And um, it's not really that special anymore. It's not really that protected anymore. So the agreement's pretty much useless. So sometimes you really got to ask yourself, what is it you want to protect and how to protect it? There are better ways to protect things like this. Uh, you can do things like trademarks on a combination of ingredients and promote the trademark. That might be a better approach and more enforceable. So enough about IPs. Let's move on to an interesting bonus round, which I had to call passing off. I had an account encounter with this recently, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs coming out, um, you know, think, you know, I can make a product kind of looks the same, but not the same. Well, I got dragged into this um, interesting legal lawsuit, which cost me a pretty sum of money. Uh, interestingly enough, this project, we only earned around 5,000 ringgit for packing it. Uh, so I was pretty pissed off at it. But I'm here to share with you on what to avoid and how to get, uh, how to not get into this situation. Uh, passing off is a very interesting concept. There's not many cases that have been run off as passing off. Um, it is quite a big extension of the IP law. Um, you know, just because the product is not called the same name or is spelled differently or rearranged in that sense doesn't mean it's not passing off. Passing off, uh, from my understanding, from my lawyer, was and is um, you have been able to sell the product in the same way in the similar concept and fashion. And uh, that principal brand which you've been copying has suffered a loss and damages and because of that confusion there. And if they're able to demonstrate uh, at the final stage at court that uh, the confusion has, you know, not made them lose X number of dollars or cents or whatever it is, you will be, you'll be responsible to pay for that. And um, I'll give an example on, on passing a which my lawyer gave for me. Was a good lawyer, very expensive, but good. There's a reason why they're expensive. Um, it's like this. Uh, for example, let's say we have brand A and there's brand B, which has, um, you know, different name. Similar color scheme, changed some colors here and there, but it's a totally different name. But brand A decides to run uh, a contest to give a five ringgit voucher. And when they give this five ringgit voucher uh, out, people came around and uh, submitted in these uh, brand B receipts as evidence of purchase and started to redeem the five ringgit vouchers. And this is a real use case study. It's happened before. Uh, there was about, out of about 2,500 over were from brand B and the court awarded uh, brand A the losses of 500 of the vouchers plus an extension of how many years projection of loss in sales. So it became a very expensive undertaking. And the only reason why us factories were dragged into it was because uh, that customer decided to write our name on the packaging uh, when uh, we did not give express consent and nor did the product require it. So this is how it's happened. And I think it just pretty much told me to tell those two customers to take a hike when I see them next time, but it's something to avoid. And uh, it's very expensive. Uh, and when people want to take you all the way, it, it can get very expensive. Uh, to get us out of that, just to get a strict, uh, what they call going for a strikeout, uh, cost us around 50,000 million. Um, damages, of course, were in millions, whatever story they had. But end of the day, the story is create a unique, distinguishable product. Um, you could try to ride on similar trends in what they're selling. But don't try to pass off a product. There's so much passing off going off in Malaysia, which you can see. Sometimes you look at the product and you yourself are confused. That is definitely passing off. Whether the company wants to take it all the way is a separate story. So I've been in there. It's not fun. Don't go and do it. Uh, because if you look at it and it's the same, uh, we will probably make you sign a contract that will say that you are all legally uh, responsible for all those things. So Try to avoid this type of thing. Um, there are a lot of people that are looking for that quick buck. And uh, there's a reason why it's easy to make that quick buck because people are confused on the product and you might be selling it a bit cheaper. So that's one thing companies can do and take you all the way to high court. And if they run a contest or something to prove that there are damages, you will be um, responsible for those damages. It's not a joke. So that's a bonus round for IP, right? So going back towards uh, your business, as an OEM business, there are so many things you need to do. There's so many things that you need to really consider. Um, one of the big things is uh, have a look at your competition, companies that you uh, aspire to be. Do a basic SWOT analysis. You know, look at, uh, sit in the seat there and pretend you're that company and look at the SWOT analysis and try to figure out 
uh, what's their strengths, what their weaknesses, and see some opportunities that you and draft it out and see whether those opportunities make sense to you. And what are the threats to the business? Be it yourself, maybe you are the threat. After that, I mean, there's a lot of SWATs. You can't just do one, you have to do a few uh, at different perspectives that you're thinking about. The other one after that is your own business. Uh, have you done your business model canvas? Uh, there's one downside to the business model canvas. It does not measure risk, uh, which I highly recommend you do be respectful. Look at the risks, the downsides of doing this business. What is it you're, you're putting in? What's the sweat that you've got to come up with? Uh, the BMC more, more or less looks at a positive part about your business and really drive down into that supply chain, um, which we will cover today in terms of the contract, uh, in terms of the OEM business stuff, what to look out for and, and what's, the, what's the full supply chain like. And I'll explain to you later why you want to understand this and take the effort. You only need to do it once or twice. And after that, you've got it off the tips of your fingertips on what's the uh, price points like. Uh, a big important one is your budget. You know, what's your runway? How many months can you survive um, with that cash in the bank? Or is it a part-time type of thing? You know, you're gonna do it on the side while you're working a full-time job before you convert fully into it. Uh, but when is that uh, transition point? Uh, and a big one here is, of course, um, I realize with a lot of new customers that we get uh, are the margins. And we'll go through these margins here. Um, I have a rough template and a guide on what type of margins you should be looking at for, um, let's say, a product that you want to go to retail, be it the pharmacy, uh, Tesco, or even selling it online. What's the target cost complete? Uh, meaning, uh, you know, for example, you, you make a cosmetic product. This is just for calculation sakes, right? Including the box, the packaging, all in, what's the maximum cost that you, your, your model can afford? So if Five ringgit, 10 ringgit, 20 ringgit maximum cost. Of course, it doesn't mean you need to meet that maximum cost, but that just gives you a rough guide uh, onto what you can negotiate with the factory and what you should be looking out for. The retailer margins, advertising costs, merchandising costs, miscellaneous costs. Uh, these are very, very different across different uh, across the board in terms of your brand. I would assume the brand is new, uh, and I'll go through those a bit later. And uh, I have a spreadsheet for you, so you can not a spreadsheet. I have a PowerPoint for you, so you can copy it and whatever, and you can figure it out there and try to build your Excel spreadsheet from there in terms of the percentages. And a very big one, uh, which a lot of people uh, struggle with is of course the marketing of the product. And there's so many ways to market with and without money. Um, and this is something we'll cover today. I'll probably focus a bit more on online marketing because it's got this COVID pandemic thing going on. And uh, offline marketing, of course, it's, it has its time and place now, but I would say, um, based on the data given to me from retailers, um, the volume is still very um, low compared to before COVID. And um, a lot of people are still buying online and uh, there's Facebook and Google. But I think a lot of people don't really understand uh, Facebook and Google, they're two different platforms selling in two different uh, perspectives. Why I would say that Google is more of a solution-based platform because when you use Google, you're usually searching for a question and you're looking for an answer, which means the quality of traffic, if you target it correctly, would be much higher, which also means that a lot of people will pay a bit more for this quality of traffic coming in. And uh, it's always phrased as a question usually. For example, um, how do I whiten my skin? I want fairer skin. And that would target a beauty product into there. And because that individual is looking to whiten or brighten their skin, it means they are looking for a product or a solution to that. Facebook is more of push marketing than it's in your face and opportunist, opportunity. Uh, and we realize that as well with the traffic that we've generated in the sense of OEM uh, business, Facebook is very, very much into pushing. And it means that we have a lot of traffic coming in, but the percentage of conversion is low. So it's a volume game and it's a game of um, people who are on the fence and you just want to ask them, you know, maybe you want to do this, maybe you don't. And then it just gets that conversation moving, right? So that is something uh, that you have to think about. And I'll go through it in a bit more uh, once we go deeper into this, um, this presentation of OEM business. So I'll give it uh, a bit of something for you guys to think about. Um, maybe get a pen and paper and, and stuff like that. Uh, think about uh, when you want to make a product, and this is in the context of OEM business, your concept and uh, discussion points, right? What's the cost point you want your product at and why? Uh, as a general rule of thumb for um, retail products, 
for example, uh, let's say we are selling uh, a hand wash. Hand wash are usually FMCG products. Uh, they're very fast moving and um, they're not things like collagen uh, or those um, 100 buck products or 50 to 100 buck products. When you see something between 50 to 100, usually you can divide it by five and that will give you a rough estimate on the true cost of the product. No more than, if it's 50, more than, no more than 10, if it's 100, no more than 20. And that's for the whole unit of whatever it's selling. If it's an FMCG product, you will usually discount around about 50%, but half. That's max. Sometimes if it's really fast moving, it's only 35% margin to 25% margin. So that's your cost points. So by having the right cost points, you can try to decide whether that the, you know, that, that landscape of products that you want to sell into, whether you want to go into it. Because in the beginning, you look at it, wow, it looks so expensive. You know, I think they're making a lot of money. Sometimes the products, especially if they're fast moving, they make razor thin margins. And we're talking on the cents of the cents on the dollar, could be 20, 30 cents. And those are for products which usually have a very, very extensive marketing uh, budget and a very, very long term. The less well known you are, the bigger the margins you are usually expected to give to the retailer. It doesn't mean the retailer is going to push your product. It just incentivizes them to have it on the shelf. You have to remember this. Uh, when you do that, you still have to do the marketing, right? So those are your cost points. Um, talk about thinking, think about the export markets. This is a hit and miss. Sometimes people go into a business and they really have potential export markets they want to sell to. Very rare, uh, but definitely something you want to consider uh, because um, in, in the sense of your planning for your business, a five-year plan, 10-year plan, you want to know where you want to go. Uh, usually I would recommend, because if you're just searching around, to go for the low-hanging fruits. We're talking about Hong Kong, Singapore. Those are the easiest. Um, those are an example of countries which are relatively easy to export your products to. Uh, a next pointer for you to think about now is um, design requirements. Uh, in the sense of how do you need the packaging to look like? Do you have a matte lamp? Do you need a hot stamp? Stuff like that. And the reason why you need to know this is um, when you run your product uh, and you're, you know, you're always thinking about, you know, I need to run the minimum run for the, for the factory. Um, there are so many constraints in there. The factory usually is not the biggest cost limiting factor for the, for the MOQs and stuff. The biggest cost is actually in packaging. You see, if you run 500 units of a box, for example, the price difference would be two times to three times the original cost from 1,000 to 5,000 units of a box. So it might be even cheaper for you to actually invest in the box and warehouse the box as opposed to pay for that 1,000 units of boxes. But it also depends on what you are comfortable with and how much capital you have available to do this because that would really um, affect the cost of the, the total cost, that cost point that you're trying to work at. Um, there's a few ways around this. Um, if your cost point permits, um, you just have a slightly higher cost and anticipate the cost to reduce once your volume increases to 5,000 to 10,000 pieces and you just factor that into your business plan. Uh, a lot of people don't do that, but I would recommend it to be factored into them. I know you, you can predict your liquidity of your money a bit better and, and manage that cash flow. And again, as I always reiterate, you know, have that unique selling point. What was that distinguishing factor uh, that is gonna make you different from the rest? You know, there's so many products on the market. Uh, in terms of taste and uh, samples, uh, the product itself before you even run it, uh, definitely run the samples. Don't rush. You know, we have so many customers rushing to complete their products because of timeline and stuff. Uh, yes, I understand that, uh, you know, time is, the, time is a luxury and people do have a set time, but when you rush things, especially very new things, things tend to go wrong. Uh, you know, you, you tend to, to omit things like stability studies, um, you know, the color and the taste. And I think things like that, um, for a great quality product for, for those companies that, you know, we, we feel do well are those that appreciate this and, and understand that, you know, science is never perfect and there's always uh, room for improvement. Um, but before even starting the product is to get to that 80% point on satisfaction, be it taste, be it stability. So these, these are things that you want to think about and probably list down and think about when you run your new product, right? Uh, this one is more for those with research ideas. Uh, so you have a, an extract or um, a piece of research that you want to commercialize or concept. So 
you have a research and um, for example, for us, the Mangoes team uh, research, which is what we worked on and what we invested in, there is this flow, which I have uh, drawn up for you. And one big one in the, and this is not for everyone, right? This is more for people who have, um, who have a farm in something and they wanna, they wanna sell it or wanna do a bit of more further processing on it, is you have to consider the raw material supply. Is there enough supply of this raw material when we do scaling? And I think a big problem with this is, um, you know, you have the great idea, you have that great piece of research, you could have probably invested in the patent and whatnot, but you don't have enough raw material supply and you don't have a factory to help you uh, scale this. So that's one very big one right there. Um, I'll share these slides with you guys later because I think this content is not too relevant to us today. And here is your, I call it a pricing degustation. This is the breakdown on pricing on, on non um, FMCG products. You can factor these percentages into your spreadsheets. Um, retailers are looking between 30 to 50% for products which are not popular in the sense of a new entry. Advertising budgets, you are range around 2 to 10%. Warehousing is around 2%. Uh, your own margins, are sometimes from zero because you're starting, you're trying to push the product out and you're giving away margins to everyone left, right, and center. Um, it doesn't mean that you cannot readjust this margin later. Um, when your product is really popular, the retailers have no choice but to swallow that reduction in margin because people are demanding the product. So if you're placed everywhere and you know the magazines are there and people always ask for your product, you have no problem. You know you can just keep um, you can just reduce the margins with them, and it, and, it, and it's doable. But you have to be confident that your product is in that high demand, right? <laughs> Another one is actually in your supplements as I'm talk, talking about you, you know, an example is if it's 100 ringgit, you divide by five, 20 bucks. Um, it can be less, but not more because, you know, you have to factor in all these other percentages and margins there. It will just make your target retail price a bit more than what it is, which could reduce your competitive edge, which is what you've been looking at. Uh, this includes the packaging and all that. So packaging, don't disregard, they are a bit expensive. Um, boxes, uh, bottles, sachets. And sachet printing is a big one as well. Uh, right now, um, they're very competitive. I think you can get fully printed sachets around about 5,000 to 10,000 sachets, which is not a lot, uh, at 20 cents to 25 cents. I think market rate is going around there per piece, fully printed, and you don't have to warehouse those super massive rolls. Uh, when you can afford it, you can do the roll printing, the really big ones. And uh, those would generate around about 500,000 sachets. It brings the cost down to around about six to eight cents. So for those sachet players out there, those are the numbers you can put in, six to eight cents. Then you ask yourself, I want higher margins. Well, for me, there's only two ways higher margins come about, right? You have a unique technology, which others cannot get to, and it's difficult for others to replicate. Then of course, you can, you can command that margin. And the second is perceived value. People, um, the way you market the product, the way you place it, people perceive it as having that higher value. It's all up to you if you want that higher margin. But there's one thing that you can't do and you struggle to do is when you, when you, when you start at a price point in the beginning, it's almost very hard to go back up in price point, maybe slightly while revised product, but almost very, very hard. A lot of customers do not like this. And the reason being is in Malaysian context, we love discounts. So um, if you're doing a bundle and all that, great, sells well. If not, you go up in price, more than likely you'll, you'll probably see that your, that your sales starts to reduce. So it's easy to go down, but not go up. But once you go down, people remember, and you know everything's available online now. So your pricing is probably quite likely I know tracked by some type of search engine and people will be able to figure out, you know what, this person always sells during Christmas at a 25% uh, markup. So I'll probably just wait then to buy. So something like, these are things that you have to consider, especially when you're trying to generate that quick cash. And money. So we're gonna talk about now uh, the complete supply chain and why it's relevant to you and why should you even give a damn about it? You know, I thought, you know, a lot of people tell me, you know what, I come to you, you should know the whole thing, you tell me. Well, definitely, yes, I can tell you, I can, I can guide you uh, through the whole supply chain, but the whole supply chain is not in my hand. You know, I, what I do as a factory, I just pack. I buy from other suppliers as well. I buy from raw material supplies. Some of the raw material I supply, 
The packaging, I buy, I, you know, I'm dependent on packaging guys. I buy packaging from people. I buy the boxes from other people. I buy stickers from other people. And the reason why you want to understand this is, um, let's say uh, you're looking to cost down and you, know, you have a budget, X budget in mind. And I think by understanding this, you really know the costs that are involved in your product. And a lot of people are not putting effort into this area. Uh, I know it's tedious, laborious, and the questions might be very, very unpleasant. But it's important to know this because, um, for example, um, let's say uh, you are doing collagen, for example. It's 10, what, 15 gram collagen in a sachet, 10 grams is collagen. So without a doubt, majority of the cost of your product goes into collagen. And you want to know uh, roughly how much the factory is making and how much you can squeeze the factory. Um, and maybe because now you're new, you, know, you don't really uh, have the position to negotiate. Um, but it is definitely a, a way to start a negotiating with people. And it's quite, the reason being is coming here. I'm going to tell you how to do this. Um, let's say the majority of the cost is collagen and the factory is just interested in packing like us. We don't care. You can buy the collagen from us. You can supply us the collagen. Uh, when you supply the collagen, you have some paperwork so you need to give to us. But we will, irrespectively, we don't really have a problem with you supplying to us. And most factories don't. So when you supply that collagen to us, then the factory doesn't need to buy the collagen, which means that you know the factory doesn't need to mark up on um, the admin charges, money movement, and stuff like that. You know, no one's going to do anything for free. So if you've managed that yourself, and you probably easily save yourself a couple of thousand. Of course, it might not be what you want to do in the beginning because it's a lot of additional work. You've got to do warehousing and stuff like that. But it's something for you to understand. Again, packaging. Maybe the factory is quoting you know the box. I'm going to quote you three ringgit because you do so so few. Well, the, the factory has to make up a little bit of money from that box, right? Maybe 20 cents, 30 cents to trade it from you. So maybe the true cost is 250 cents. An interesting thing is the factory themselves are not printing the box. You can go to the box manufacturer and ask them to quote you. And a lot of times you would ask yourself, you know, the factory's not just to deal business with me and stuff like that. I digress. I think the market is extremely competitive now. They might ask just for one thing, full payment up front which is very common now. Even the factory, even other box guys are asking us for full payment. No one's got credit terms going on now in, in the current market situation. Cash is what everyone is preserving. Them. So most businesses right now, more than ever, you can approach the factories and ask them and try to break down that cost of your product. Then you have a better way to negotiate with the factory. And I think sometimes the factories also appreciate it. You know, people like us, for me, for example, it's just one less more raw material for me to handle. And you handle it. I don't mind. I don't need to earn that money. I'm just, I just want to earn the contract packing money. All this other money to do trading raw materials and stuff, sure, you know, it's great. Great money. But it creates another set of headaches, which I need to factor in the costing for you. So if you are able to manage that part, and it's your, it's your cup of tea, because it's your product, you can save that money. Uh, but not all factories are like us. You just got to find a factory that... Um, has this attitude towards um, business, right? And everything they know quite, uh, quite clearly where they're cutting down costs. Sometimes the, the factory's co-packing fees is, is you know, it's ridiculously cheap. They just make money trading with the raw materials. Things like that is, uh, is, a, is something that you should have to really consider. So I, I come about to one way of thinking about this. Always be curious and always learn because um, you're not, you might not be interested in uh, all, this, all these little details in the beginning, but it's your product, you have to know. You have to know how much you know, your packaging is gonna to contribute to your cost. You have to know how much roughly your formulation uh, for different raw materials will cost. And with that understanding, you really understand where most of that cost comes from. Factories usually for low quantity uh, packing job, they earn probably around 30% of the total price, maybe 15. They can go all the way down to 10 or five if your volume is massive. But usually those are the percentages you're looking at. Um, it's nothing, it's no secret actually. Uh, it doesn't take long for you to figure it out once you, you, you go around and survey the pricing. The problem with surveying on pricing is what I realized is um, the speed of quotation is ridiculously slow, um, which is something that uh, you know, we, have, we have spent a lot of time overcoming at Furley, but it's, as a business entrepreneur, I'm trying to survey price. Bloody mess, headache takes about a month, month plus.
to get quotations out for certain products, especially if there are certain raw materials you're asking from them, because not everyone stocks these raw materials. Sometimes it's not the factory's fault, it's the supplier's fault, supplier's slow, yeah? So these are some things you can remember. So again, I will recap on this. Understand that the whole supply chain, look at the raw materials, the major raw materials, which are contributing to the majority of the cost of the big product. Look at the packaging. What's the cost of the packaging based on the quantities you are, that you want to order? Quote different variety of uh, quantities, then you can manage it a bit better. You'll be surprised. 500, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 pieces. The pricing is massively different once you reach 5,000 pieces, especially for boxes uh, and cosmetics and stuff like that. Just think about those things, have them quoted. You might not be able to afford it now. Maybe you can afford it later in the future. So you know how much additional margin you can get out of it when you are pushing that across, right? So now is the science time. I hope you guys um, are ready for this part. So um, I'm gonna be talking a bit more about um, the packaging, um, spoilage, um, the technicalities of it, and why it's important to you. Um, reason being is a lot of times uh, you will depend on the factory or you'll depend on your agent or whatever, or runner or whatever it is that's doing your OEM product. Honestly, I don't recommend um, going through third parties to do um, manufacturing work. Factories are pretty available right now. Uh, you can probably find them online because when you go through that additional layer, it's additional cost. And I'm not too sure what value um, the agent is giving to you on the third party. I've seen them around. Um, that's something to consider. They've got good one, they got bad one. So it really depends on you. Uh, the reason why it's a bit better to deal directly with factories is, um, you know, you're talking directly to the factories, so you get exactly what you want. And the costing should probably be the most optimal way. So we're gonna talk about some stuff in science, gonna be a little bit of science, not too much. Uh, talk about spoilage. And, uh, you know, factors to think about when you're making your own product, be it powder, juice, some of them, I think there was a good time I was spending in Cradle was doing uh, for these blachan and all that type of thing, packing at home, stuff like that. So we just go through a few variables here uh, in the next slide. So what is the packaging type you want and why is it important? Um, and this will govern with how factory you're looking for. So sometimes when you have your idea, you say, I want it in a sachet, I want it in a canister, I want it in a bottle. There's so many things you have to look at. First thing is, when it's in a sachet, you would expect it to have um, that barrier of protection, right? Because it's in a sachet. When it's in a sachet, uh, powder context-wise, and even uh, cosmetic, uh, those liquids, it's a barrier to the environment. It's a barrier to moisture. It's a barrier to um, air. So you would expect it to be a bit more stable. And that is usually true. Um, there's one thing that is not true is um, when you put liquids into um, sachets, these type of sachets here, for example, uh, the sachet material itself, um, especially if it's high in oil, oil, yeah, oil, oil tends to uh, penetrate through plastic. <laughs> so have you ever bought a cosmetic product and it's in the, in the some jars and stuff, and then it becomes very sticky and, and weird and stuff like that. Same as tubes after a bit of time. This is a problem with uh, cosmetics um, when, the, when the packaging is not uh, lined correctly for it, it tends to go through the plastic and it can happen with um, foils as well. So you have to know this and you have to understand that um, certain types of packaging might not be suitable for your product unless you anticipate your product to be very fast moving and people are not gonna hold these products in hand or on the warehouse too long for extended periods of time. I'm speaking about two years plus, sometimes people have not sold their stock. Then you will fall into this type of category of problems. And um, there's certain things you wanna think about. So when you think about this, the first thing is you wanna ask, um, is this material compatible with whatever I wanna pack in it? And I think a good question, a good one that a lot of people have seen is, uh, you know those red containers that you get during uh, Chinese New Year, Hari Raya, all those containers, you know? Loose cap, that's terrible types of packaging. That only just protects it from big insects and stuff, but you know, it lets air in, it lets oxygen in, 
it, it lets everything in except the big uh, big tests. It's very, very much designed for super fast moving goods. It's not a very good container to store stuff. So we're gonna talk about the packaging. You know, we need to talk about, we want it to be a barrier to the environment. And these are questions that you wanna ask um, your suppliers or your OEM factory, which is making the product for you. Sachets in general really are okay. It's usually the stuff that's packed into canisters. And uh, for example, um, maybe you have a powder collagen you want to pack into a canister. You've got the canisters, you've got the paper canisters, you've got the plastic canisters, you've got the inserts. Those don't really protect much after you've opened them, especially the plastic canisters, because they already allow uh, micro leaking, like we call it, and a small degree of air will go into it. You have to remember in Malaysia, our moisture is at 80% humidity in the, in the normal environment on air condition, which means there's a significant amount of water in the air. So your product, uh, the shelf life will reduce drastically. So by using the top packaging, and um, you could probably have, um, you can have, have a lot of, I can't hear anything. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can check. Jess can't hear anything. Is it lag? Oh, really? Is it true? Oh, okay, cool. Uh, then I will continue then. Sorry, guys, I'll continue. Uh, so then, yeah, cool. So then when you're talking about the pre-treatment, on the packaging, uh, we're talking about things like UHT packs. Uh, there are downsides to it, and most of you guys won't do the UHT pack. You don't need to really go into it for one reason. Um, UHT packs are really for high volume output uh, products. We're talking about you know the milk cartons and that little square box. Uh, you'll be looking at an easy six figure investment to run with a contract packer here. The reason being is um, that pack packet that. That, that, that paper, that special paper comes from Tetra Pak and they don't really sell uh, third party uh, packaging for that. Um, not something for you, but it, to appreciate the science more on why UHT uh, is the preferred packaging for those type of products is because um, it, it's the word ultra high heat. So it uses an ultra high heat temperature. I think if I remember correctly in my science, I think it's 80 degrees or 100 something degrees. I think it's 80 degrees at I think a fraction of a second, two to three seconds. Uh, and then after that, it kills all the bacteria and stuff. The downside to that is, um, especially with milk or anything with a flavor uh, type of profile is, when you do that, um, the flavor will change significantly when I mean, you use UHT pack. So that's one thing to remember. Retort is more of for canning or glass, you know, those jars, the jam stuff. You've got the lug cap on top of the little button, you know, that button thing. So if the button thing opens, you know it's the retort is, or the product has been opened before because retort uses a similar concept to UHT, but longer duration of time. So that exposes the product to high heat. And then after that, it cools it down fast and rapidly using a, you know, it could be an ice bath, could be a water sprinkler system. And that would create a retort uh, for your product, which would uh, kill all the bacteria and stuff like that. Or you just go for the powders, or you go for preservatives. Uh, a lot of cosmetics, you know, they talk about parabens. Well, if you know what a paraben is, paraben is actually the preservative inside the cosmetic. And there's many other types that we can talk about now. The reason why powders are a lot of the preferred way is because powders omit one thing, which spoilage needs to occur, moisture. So let's go into the science of it a bit more. So these are some things you can note for um, spoilage and stability of your product. Uh, we talk about microorganisms. These are bacteria, yeast, mold. And if you go in a bit more depth, we call aerobic bacteria, anaerobic bacteria, fungus. So aerobic bacteria are bacteria that uh, need oxygen, air, to metabolize. Anaerobic bacteria are those that don't use air. And those are usually involved in fermentation. Uh, yeasts are similar. They don't necessarily require oxygen and they can metabolize inside any environment. Uh, just on the got food. And the reason why you want to know this is when you have your product in, in, in some type of packaging or form factor, you want to know that um, you want to be able to stop these things from happening. So a lot of times, especially when we're moving into the future of products, 
there's a very big push to omit preservatives and conditioning agents, right? And I think these type of things are what we need to be aware of and what and, and we need to be able to create products which are relevant for these type of uh, these conditions, right? So it's important to know these things. And there's another thing called enzymes, which is not really um, not really well understood by a lot of people. And we talk about products which change color over time. Uh, there's, I think, two processes which are which are predominant. We call them enzymatic brown, browning and non-enzymatic brown. And this is, uh, if I remember correctly, there's one where um, you, know, you have a reducing sugar. You don't need to know that context. It's just some type of sugar. You got a protein, and then when you mix them together, it, it makes things go brown. And even powders uh, can go brown from this. Uh, no doubt that we believe that powders are the most stable. There is a chance a powder can turn brown even in the sachet. So uh, don't take this for granted. We have had products spectacularly fail because of that, um, because of that reducing sugar being present and that being mixed with uh, what they call, um, you know, that the proteins and stuff. And that causes bloating and, you know, releases water and stuff like that. You don't need to know the details of that. You just need to know that even powders can turn brown. A big one is also air, oxygen, and a source of carbon dioxide. These are both uh, these are both ingredients which microbes would use to metabolize. Um, of course, most aerobes or even humans they breathe air, right? And then some of them don't need this. Now the ones like I had a recent project with this, uh, and what we discovered for a household range of project uh, products. Sometimes there is a reason why the container is brown and black and, or white, and it's not transparent. It's because the, pro the liquid inside is prone to um, UV light oxidation and it's prone to UV light. UV light is found in just normal natural sunlight. And how the chemistry of this works is quite, I'll just summarize it for you. The UV light or the spectrum of light which has UV um, introduces free radicals, which are you know kind of harmful. The same concept of doing giving you skin cancer and stuff like that, right? So it bombards all this energy into the product. And then by continuously bombarding it into certain uh, ingredients, uh, such as our hand wash, uh, which is, you know, this is all natural hand wash and stuff. It would do things uh, chemically to the, to the surfactants, causing them to yellow. And uh, we thought it was the chemical. Ends up, it was the bottle that was yellowing. So light is a big one. Uh, and I think the reason why I think these are so important is, you know, sometimes you're just sitting there and trying to figure out what is going wrong with the product. My product's not stable. Well, if you've done it in advance, you would have known. Other things are insects and pests, uh, physical damage. Uh, one, the reason why I put physical damage here is uh, logistic wise, um, you know, everyone be using, you know, whoever, post you, whatever, whoever's sending the stuff for you, they don't give a shit on how they, handle your stuff. They'll kick it. They'll, you have to anticipate the worst situation on how they handle your products because, um, you know, things can come in kicked and all that. So you have to really design and allow packaging certain degree of tolerance and strength, especially if you're sending it by courier. Um, if it's on the retail shelf, it's a separate story. There's a bit more care taken into that. The next one is temperature and time. Temperature being is what is the maximum temperature that your product is stable at? And this is part of actually a stability study, uh, which is more than likely omitted in most uh, manufacturing uh, processes in the sense of doing a full scale accelerated stability study. Different temperatures will affect the product differently. Most products in general uh, have been formulated to be stable across majority of temperatures uh, being ambient, so we're talking around about up to 40, maximum 50 degrees C. But cosmetics and powders, powder is not so as if they're in sachet. If the sachet is done well, usually no problem. It's usually the liquid stuff, juices and cosmetics. Cosmetics prone to a separation because when you have a high heat and you have to remember when you make a cosmetic, it's an oil in a water or water and oil. So it's like, you know, if you try to add oil to water, it's, it separates and stuff. So you add stuff to it to make it emulsify. And sometimes when the temperature is high and then it drops back down, it causes separation, which is not what you want in your product. Uh, this is why I, again, I reiterate that you have to challenge and test these products out. Yeah, Nora, you wanted to say something, is it? Oh, uh, no, I was just, because it's close to our break time. So ah. 
I wanted to let you finish first. Go ahead. Okay, cool. So then um, I'll just finish these ones off. So when you have the separation of the products, you have complete product failure. So even with the samples that you sometimes will pay for or the factory gives to you, take it, put it in the car, take it, put it in the oven, heat it up a bit, cool it down a bit. It's not unreasonable to do this. And this is actually what we do at Furley to uh, figure out on the stability of the formulation, provided the time given to us is, is allowed. Another question you want to remember is the time factor. How long do you anticipate this product to be on the shelf? How long do you anticipate to warehouse this product? The reason being is when you want to warehouse these things, they could be sitting at, you know, on a shelf for a prolonged period of time. And I think during this MCO, we had one mega complaint coming from our juice manufacturing line. Uh, there was residue on the top. We pretend this is a bottle, right? And there's residue on the top here. They open the cap, there's residue. And then they complained. They said it's spoilage. You got spoilage in the product. You know, your factory screwed up. You know, spoilage. Okay. So funny thing is, that product, there's preservative inside. So highly unlikely spoilage. When you open it, it doesn't have mold, doesn't have smell. So we know not spoilage. It's actually the sedimentation from the juice. And the only reason why it's on the cap is because it's stored like this. The cap's facing down. So they had the box upside down over a prolonged period of time because of the COVID thing, right? So people didn't go back to the office, everything was, uh, was stuck. So that's what happened. And uh, even though we told them that you need to shake it and stuff, they didn't shake it vigorously enough and that caused this issue to occur. So things like this, if that's the case, clearly write on the box, on the label that, you know, you need to shake the product vigorously, only store in one position. It has to be stored standing up. So. This is uh, the end of the spoilage and stability part. And uh, I think it's break time, right, Nora? How long are we having our break? Uh, the break is for 10 minutes, Mr. Kelvin. All right, thanks, Nora. So I'll pass it back to you. All right, okay, so as mentioned, um, we will be having a 10 minute break right now. So stretch away, get a drink, and then we'll see you in 10 minutes at 11, show, well, it's 11.03 now. So we'll make it 11.13, everybody. All right, thank you. See you in 10 minutes.